Welcome back, everybody. Um, so now for the uh, second part of the session that's giving you an update on what's going on on the big health related studies. Uh, and this session will include ELSA, uh, UCL GOHOT studies and Understanding Society. And we are getting started with presentation by ELSA. We have presenting uh, Lucy Engelfield and Bex Williams from NATSEN. They are in the Longitudinal Studies team and work across a variety of Longitudinal Studies. So I'll hand over to you guys. Thanks, Mario. Uh, so, yeah, welcome to Life Over 50 in the 21st Century, updates from the English Longitudinal Study of Ageing. Uh, so, just to give a quick overview of what we'll cover, I'll give a background to ELSA um, and then a bit of information about the current Wave 11, and then Bex will talk a little bit about uh, some of the sub-studies we have going on, so the End of Life Study and the Life History Sub-Study. And then Bex will also speak a little bit about data and impact. So quick background to ELSA. So ELSA is a population cohort study. Uh, it's a study of adults aged 50 and above living in England, and we also interview their partners. It began in 2002, and we interview the same group of people every two years. So we have our existing sample, but we also have a refreshment sample introduced every couple of years. Um, and in this current Wave 11 and in uh, Wave 10 as well, we included an ethnic minority boost. It's multidisciplinary, so we explore people's health, economic and social circumstances. Um, every four years we have a health visit, so that's included in the current wave as well this year. Um, and we explore the health, lifestyles and financial situations of people as they grow older. So fieldwork is carried out by NATSEN, uh, but we collaborate with UCL, uh, Institute of Fiscal Studies, UEA and Manchester University as well. Uh, it receives funding from the National Institute on Ageing in the US. Uh, and also a range of UK government departments. So this slide gives an overview of the different uh, studies kind of going on in ELSA. So we have the main stage field work, which includes a main interview that all of our core members uh, partake every two years. As I mentioned, every four years we have a health visit um, where we collect various biomeasures from core members, such as blood pressure and lung function. Uh, we also have had a sub-study called HCAP, which stands for the Healthy Cognitive Aging Project. Uh, we carry out cognitive tasks to measure and understand cognitive decline and also dementia risks uh, with our participants. Uh, we also carry out end-of-life interviews. These are interviews with um, a relative or friend of a participant, an else participant, after they passed away uh, to understand the kind of circumstances leading up to, to their death. And there's also a life history sub-study. Uh, and this is a separate web or telephone interview where we collect data about our participants' lives before they joined ELSA. So this slide gives an overview of where we are at present. So we're currently uh, carrying out Wave 11 fieldwork. At the end of each wave, uh, we produce a report and data will become available in the UK archive. So a little bit about Wave 11. So as I've briefly mentioned, we have uh, two different sort of types of ELSA sample members. We have our existing sample, and these are people who have taken part in at least one wave of ELSA. And then we also have a refreshment sample. So these are new members of the sample. Uh, we recruit them when they're aged between 50 and 64. Uh, we involve an ethnic minority boost in this wave and in the previous wave. And we recruit these sample members from either Health Survey of England or the Family Resource Survey. So they've previously taken part and uh, indicated that they're happy to be contacted about future research. So Wave 11 design, uh, our participants can either be interviewed in person, the majority are in, in, interviewed in person, but if they prefer, we do have the option for a video call interview. They also complete a self-completion questionnaire, which contains some more uh, sensitive questions. And then we have a follow-up health visit if they uh, consent to this. And then this slide summarises the main interview content. So we collect information about uh, the household and individual demographics, uh, ask some questions about their health, including uh, a coding of any prescribed medications that they're taking. We ask questions about their social participation, work and pensions, income and assets, housing and consumption. We carry out various cognitive assessment tasks uh, during the interview, uh, ask them about their expectations for later life, effort and reward, psychosocial health. We collect their consent to link their survey responses to admin data sources, 
Um, we collect a time walk measurement for how long it takes them to walk a distance of eight feet at their kind of average walking pace. Um, they'll complete the self-completion questionnaire, which contains those more sensitive questions. And we also collect their agreement to uh, take part in a health visit and be contacted by a biomedical professional for that follow-up visit. <coughs> and then if they consent to that, they'll have a health visit um, where we'll collect various biomeasures. So we measure their blood pressure, grip strength, uh, take a blood sample, measure their height and weight, uh, balance, leg raise test, uh, their lung function, and also collect a hair sample. Uh, respondents can refuse any measure. Um, we collect their written consent to collect the blood sample uh, and also to send on their results to their GP if they wish. Uh, we do give them some results during the interview. Uh, I think blood pressure and uh, lung function they can receive uh, during the interview if they'd like that. And then we send their blood results after being analysed to the respondent and also to their GP if they consented to that. And the lung function results can be sent to their GP as well. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Bex to talk a little bit about end of life. Okay, um, so um, as Lucy said, we have a few sub-studies going on at the moment. So first, the end of life. Um, so the end of life interviews were previously carried out in waves two, three, four, six, and we've recently done them on HCAP as well. Um, and they are part of wave 11. Um, so these interviews, interviews cover um, different topics, including the health, psychological, and spiritual well-being of the participant, um, their so social circumstances and residence of the cohort member between their last ELSA interview and death, and any economic consequences for the family. This is uh, an important part of ELSA because um, as ELSA is a study of ageing, we want to ensure we include all aspects of ageing, including the period before people die. Um, the second sub-study we have in Wave 11 is the Life History sub-study. So in 2024, we are going to collect life history data from ELSA participants who have joined the study since Wave 3. Um, we last collected this data in 2006 and 2007. The pilot will begin in uh, summer 2024 and then main stage will start soon after that. And this is a separate web or telephone interview. And the topics of this include residents and migration, work, partners and family, health, childhood living conditions and experiences. Um, and the, this data will be used for analysis, um, for example, on cognitive stimulation during work and early life experiences in relation to Alzheimer's disease risk. Okay, uh, moving on to data and impact. Um, so each WAVE report um, is published um, on the project website, um, you can see the address on the slide, and also we've recently celebrated our 20th anniversary, and there is a report which contains key findings from a selection of published articles that we use ELSA data, and you can find that on the project website as well. Um, so we have different types of ELSA data. Um, so firstly, the archive data, and this is available to registered users from the UK data service. Then we have the non-archived survey variables, um, and in that sense, ERP will consider applications on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and you can email um, the ELSA data team to find out more information and to get the application form for that. And then we have non-archived genetic data, and this is managed by UCL. Um, the ELSA data also has different levels of access on the UKZS. So firstly, we have the end user license data sets, and these are available um, for holders of the UKZS and loop user license, and this um, contains the majority of the interview data, but the sensitive or disclosive variables have been removed. Um, then we have special license data sets, um, and these contain more sensitive and disclosive variables and include some geographies. And then we have the secure access data sets, um, which contain highly sensitive and disclosive variables and include detailed geographies. Um, and you can find the ELSA documentation and user guides on the UKDS. 
Um, so the data are available from the UKDS um, archive at the moment. Um, so we have waves one to ten main interview data archived. The wave ten data set is currently in the process of being re-archived and will be available by the end of July. Um, then we also have health visit data for waves two, four, six, and eight. And um, the wave zero HSE data for participants who um, took part in ELSA before wave six. Um, then we also have end of life data for waves two, three, four, and six, and um, some financial derived variables and non financial derived variables. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Do you have questions? Yes. Sorry, uh, I think in the, the first um, speaker's remarks, you mentioned that you do phone up relatives after somebody has passed to ask some questions. and. That sounded like um, something that was familiar to me about verbal autopsy, and I know there is a WHO tool on verbal autopsy which is used for um, largely around low and middle income countries where they don't have vital statistics. <coughs> Do your questions compare to that document, or is it? Um, oh, I'm not sure. Um, no, uh, to the death records. No, to um, the, the questions that you asked yeah. after death mm. um, about yeah um i'm afraid i'm i'm not sure uh we can yeah if you find us and give us your email address we can get back to you on that yeah thanks very much thank you do we have more questions okay in that case, we'll move on to the next speaker. Excellent. So next up, we have Richard Silverwood from UCL, and he's going to give us an update on the health data in the CLS National Longitudinal Cohort Studies. Uh, Richard is uh, Associate Professor of Statistics and Chief Statistician at the UCL Centre for Longitudinal Studies. His applied research is mainly within the context of health, in particular the causes and consequences of non-communicable diseases, often taking <laughs> life post perspective. Do you want me to go <laughs> Um, he also has methodological interest, including approaches for handling missing data, the anal analysis of linked survey and administrative data, and making causal inferences from observational data. Thank, Over you. To you. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for listening. Um, so first of all, I've got lots and lots to get through, so I might have to go quite quickly, but the slides are available. There's lots of embedded links, so if it's too quick, then hopefully you can go back and pick up on things later on. Um, so firstly, very quickly, what do we do at CLS? So we're funded by the ESRC to be a, a resource centre. We run a, a series of different um, longitudinal cohort studies, which is going to be the focus of, of what I'm talking about today, each of them following thousands of people across their life, covering multiple generations, very rich data, as you're going to see. Um, and then we're providing these data to the research community for analysis, mainly via the UKDS. So we spend a lot of time uh, documenting the data, making sure that everything's uh, clear and available, and providing additional guidance and training. We also conduct our own research, so a lot of it's substantive, either using the data from our own cohorts or beyond, but also methodological work. So because we're running these surveys, we're interested in conducting research to ensure we're collecting data in the best way possible, uh, and also statistical methodological work as well, um, so that we're analyzing the data in the best way that we can and ensuring that we're guiding others to do so too. Um, so this is an overview of the, the studies that we have at CLS. So the four in the middle, the uh, National Child Development Study, uh, the 1970 British Cohort Study, Next Steps in the Millennium Cohort Study, are our four, co uh, uh, sorry, four core um, studies that I'm going to be focusing on mainly today. Recently, we've also been working on the uh, Early Life Cohort Feasibility Study that you can see on the right-hand side. Uh, I'll mention that very, very briefly at the end. 
And we also work closely with colleagues at the MRC Unit for Lifelong Health and Aging who run the um, National Survey of Health and Development uh, Individuals born in 1946, but I won't really be talking about that today. So these are the four core studies that we run at CLS. Um, so they're, they're mainly birth cohort studies. So NCDS follows um, a cohort of individuals, all individuals in Great Britain, born in one week in 1958. Um, the British cohort study similarly follows all individuals born in Great Britain in one week in 1970. Next Steps is a bit different in that individuals weren't recruited um, until 2004 when they were in year nine at school, so age 13 to 14. So they were born uh, 1989 to 1990, and we only, only start following them up from age 13 or 14. Uh, and then the Millennium Cohort Study, which is um, a, 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 sorry, I should have said Next Steps only covers England. Um, and the Millennium Cohort Study is um, a cohort study that's selected from individuals born right across the UK, so also including Northern Ireland between 2000 and 2002. And each of these four studies contains between 16 and 20,000 individuals um, at the start obviously subject to some subsequent uh, attrition. So these are the, the, the timelines of those um, four core studies. So the, the dots represent points in time where we've observed individuals, where we've collected data. Uh, so you can see that for, for most of the studies, this is, uh, you know, we see them quite regularly over their life courses from birth onwards, usually every five years or so. But in next steps, as I said, we don't um, even sample them until they're age 13, so we don't see them until that point in time. Uh, and then they were followed up more frequently, so once a year for the first few years, and then less frequently after that. So you can see from this the, the kind of life stages that these cohorts uh, are now in. So in NCDS, they're now in their 60s, so ap approaching retirement. Uh, BCS 70 are in their 50s, so in kind of later midlife. Uh, next steps are in their 30s, so thinking about kind of uh, family formation and their, their career trajectories. MCS in their early 20s, so maybe still finishing off their education uh, and thinking about what, where they're, how they're progressing with their life beyond that. Um, so the information that we collect across these different cohort studies obviously differs a bit depending on the life stage that the cohort members are at at that point in time. But the information that we collect sort of within that is fairly consistent across the different cohorts, which helps if you're looking to do kind of comparative work uh, between the different cohorts that we run. Um, so at birth, there's lots of information that's obviously collected about the birth itself uh, and uh, the, the experience of, of pregnancy and people's life situation at that point in time around the birth. In school years, obviously more of a focus on the, on the child, how they're got, getting on within school, uh, lots of things around their performance and their behavior, their cognitive ability and their family life. And then in, in adulthood, when the cohort members transition into adulthood, we're thinking a lot more about um, you know, their employment, their income, um, and other, you know, as they're getting older, different aspects of their health, which I guess is what we're going to be thinking about mainly today. So uh, this shows the data collections over the last few years and into the next few years. So those data collections on the left-hand side have already been completed. Uh, the data have been deposited and they're available. The ones on the right have either been uh, completed recently, in the case of Next Steps, BCS70 and NCDS, and the data will be deposited soon, or they're currently in the field in the case of MCS. Um, so really, the next few slides, I'm going to focus on the health data that we have in these uh, most recent data collections that are going to be made available soon over the next few months, sort of into early next year. Um, so I'll do that in turn with the, the different um, cohort studies, though you'll see that actually the information that's collected is very similar, so I won't dwell on it for, for the later ones. So in next steps, the age 32 sweep, the data collections finished recently, as I say. The data will be available uh, next month now in, in August. Uh, and so this is a, a fairly standard selection of variables that we observe information on in this sort of adulthood sweep in terms of the health data. Obviously, there's lots of other information being collected beyond this, this health information. So it's kind of general health and well-being questions, um, things about specific diseases and conditions, other kind of health-related behaviors, uh, and then more recently, a focus on, on COVID as well. Uh, and importantly here in Next Steps, we've also collected uh, saliva collection for DNA extraction and genotyping. And uh, I'll come back to that in a minute when I'm talking about genetic information. 
Uh, the BCS 70 age 51 to 53 sweep that's recently finished as well. These data will be available in November. You can see that the sorts of information we're collecting is fairly similar to the recently um, completed NCDS sweep, uh, sorry, uh, next step sweep, um, but there's some kind of age specific information that's a bit, a bit different as well. Uh, and similarly in the recently completed NCS sweep, so age 62 to 65, similar sorts of information. Uh, this data will be um, available on UKDS from January next year uh, with some, again, kind of age-specific differences. Um, but as well as this questionnaire-based information that we have in NCDS, this sweep of data collection, there was also a bi additional kind of biomedical um, module as part of this survey. So this included uh, a nurse visit, which got into a lot more detail in terms of uh, prescribed medications and then taking a lot of measurements, so kind of basic anthropometric stuff, but also uh, blood pressure, grip strength, um, blood samples that I'll come back to in a second, uh, and a few other things. Plus, there's a, an online diet questionnaire uh, that covers two days of uh, food and drink recall. So this kind of biomedical emphasis that was in the most recent uh, sweep of NCDS is something that we've done uh, a few times in, well, one time previously in NCDS, but also in the BCS 70 sweep at age 46. So collecting similar types of uh, biomed biomedical information across these, which I'll, I'll summarize some of these uh, on the next slide. Um, but just, I guess, to emphasize that having this in the same cohort means there's lots of interesting questions that we can address longitudinally. And having this at similar ages in different cohorts means that there's interesting uh, cross-cohort questions that we can address too. Uh, so this is a, a summary of some of the biomarkers that we have from those uh, biomedical sweeps in NCDS and BCS70. Um, so you can see there's quite a lot of overlap in some of them, some of them not so much. Um, and then in the NCDS suite that's just finished, you'll see at the bottom there's um, an addition of uh, some um, metabolic biomarker profiles, so metabolite data as well for the first time. Um, we've got a program of linking administrative data, not just health, also beyond that in the cohorts. So a lot of additional information has been added over the last few years. So this is just to summarize the linked administrative health data. I tried to get it all on one slide, so sorry that it's a bit small. In England, we have hospital episode statistics um, linked in for all of the four core studies, uh, sorry, four core studies uh, that I've been talking about. This is, uh, these data are available from UKDS via the Secure Lab. In Scotland, we have Scottish medical records linked into these different cohorts as appropriate. As I said, next steps is England only, so that's not got linked Scottish admin data. Um, again, UKDS Secure Lab. And then in Wales, for MCS only, we've got a couple of different options. Um, some health data that's available from the SAIL data bank, and then um, also some derived hospitalizations and diagnosis data available from UKDS. Um, just to note at the bottom, another option for accessing some of our linked administrative data is the UK Longitudinal Linkage Collaboration, uh, which was set up during the pandemic um, as a, a platform so that people could analyse linked longitudinal cohort and uh, administrative data. But the, the scope of this is due to be broadening out over the next couple of years, so there'll be a lot more um, linked administrative data available there, so that's going to be a very rich resource for this sort of analysis. Um, genetic data, so for three of the four core studies, so all of them apart from next steps, we already have genetic data available. Next steps should be coming soon now that we've um, recently been collecting saliva samples. So you can see the, the numbers um, for each of those there. MCS, the number is much higher, but that's because that includes information from the cohort members as well as their mothers and fathers. So I think almost genetic data on almost 8,000 cohort members, almost 8,000 mothers, and about 5,000 fathers. Um, and then, excitingly, we have complete trios for, I think, 3,000 families. So my genetics colleagues assure me that this is incredibly exciting. Um, and we've got a revised data access system for accessing these genetic data, so it's now kind of internal, much more straightforward. 
Um, we've got a new website that's specifically about the uh, genetic data that we have, lots of documentation on there. Um, and we're going to be releasing polygenic scores across many different health and social phenotypes, I think towards the end of this year or early next year, as well as some uh, epigenetic clock data. And our genetics team are, are really keen for people to be using these data. They're super friendly, so just get in touch with them if you're in, in any way thinking of using these data. They'd be really pleased to hear from you. Um, during the pandemic, we... Um, you know, we're in a lucky position. We've got these ongoing, very rich studies. So we wanted to, to capitalize that on that and try and address some questions around the pandemic. So we had three ways of, of surveys uh, between 2000 and, uh, sorry, 2020 and 2021, where we're collecting lots of information uh, about people's experiences of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and then on top of that, we also had a serology study. So for any of the cohort members across these different cohorts who'd responded to at least one of those three waves of uh, COVID surveys, um, we invited them to provide a blood sample via, via, via finger prick test. Uh, and then those were analyzed uh, to try and identify antibodies either due to exposure to the virus or following vaccination. And all of those data are available from UKDS for analysis. Um, three recent additions, so three new studies that we're either leading on at CLS or that we're collaborating on, which I'm going to very, very briefly talk about in two or three bullet points each. Um, so the early life cohort feasibility study is testing the feasibility of a new UK-wide birth cohort study that we're hoping uh, we'll be able to set up in its full form over the next few years. So recruiting several thousand babies from across the UK, collecting lots of information, uh, in particular testing out different approaches, novel approaches that we're using to, uh, in terms of using the sample frame, in terms of the data collection methods, in terms of data linkage approaches, lots of embedded experiments as usual, and we're in the evaluation phase at the moment. It's only a feasibility study, but the data will be available anyway next year on UKDS. Children of the 2020s is a, a nationally representative birth cohort study of babies from 8,500 families born in 2001. Um, again, focus on family, early education, childcare determinants of early school success. Um, the Wave 1 data from 2020 are available already. There's going to be four subsequent waves. I think the second wave's probably been conducted already, but I don't think the data are available yet. And finally, the COVID Social Mobility and Opportunities Study uh, is a cohort of over 12,000 students in England only in year 11 in 2021 including information from the parents. So really, we're trying to explore here in a lot of detail how the, the disruption due to the pandemics affected people's schooling, but then looking much further beyond that to see what the sort of medium and longer term consequences of that are. Um, and wave one and wave two have already been completed with data available, I think, on UKDS again. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Do we have any questions? Yep, so we've had a recent program of work where we're trying to ensure we've got complete information on um, you know, life course uh, residency for our cohort members. Um, and then that's all been geocoded. So we've got like, very rich geographical information on where people have lived throughout their lives. And then we're obviously able to link that into you know, lots of other ge geography-based databases. Um, so I think that, that program of work is still ongoing. I think ultimately we're going to have that sort of very rich data for all of our cohorts. Um, but I think the Millennium Cohort Study is the one that's most advanced in that. So there's already some research that's being conducted using that geocoding and, and linked geographic data set. So I'd have a look at that one first. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Yep. Yeah, definitely. So that's something that I think is increasingly being done using our cohorts 
um, using <coughs> other cohorts as well. Um, there's you know, there's inherent complications in that, in that if data have been collected at different points in time using different measurement instruments, then there's issues that you need to overcome about comparability. So there's perhaps some harmonization exercises that you need to do first. But for a lot of our study, some of that harmonization work's been done already. So there's publications, particularly via Closer, that are looking at harmonizing some of the, the different things like the cognitive measures, the physical activity measures. Um, and obviously, because we're running these cohorts ourselves, we have, you know, one of of our considerations when we have a new wave of data collection is how comparable is this kind of internally within the same cohort in terms of what we've collected previously on that topic on that construct but also you know between cohorts how, com how comparable is it so we, we try and make things um, prospectively harmonized I guess as much as much as possible um, but yes there's there's lots of activity in, in that area definitely thank you Richard I think we have time for one more question yeah, so I think for the, the older cohorts, the, the response rates have historically you know, been, been a bit better. Um, and I think for NCDS, at the most recent sweep, or the one before this one, um, we were down to around 60% response, but you know, they, they were in their uh, 50s by that point. So the fact that we're still getting 60% of the, that initial sample responding you know, decades later is, I think, yeah, testament to the, the team working behind this in terms of cohort maintenance, tracing, motivating individuals to continue taking part. Obviously, it means there's still a substantial amount of non-response that you need to deal with, and that's something that we, you know, have programs of work uh, dedicated to. But then in the younger cohorts, the attrition rates do tend to be a, a little bit higher, so it's an even bigger problem. Um, and in the, the COVID surveys, they were just online, whereas typically um, for the older cohorts, at least data collections have been face-to-face -face until that point in time. And also it was a pandemic. So um, the, the response rates were particularly low for the, the COVID surveys, but, but generally we do very well. Excellent, thank you. Applause for Rachel as well. Thank you. So the final talk in the session is by Mina Kumari. She will give us an overview of the, what has been happening in Understanding Society. Yes, so thanks for inviting me to talk about Understanding Society. Um, Laia did a really nice job of, sort of talking about some of the data that are available to the academic community and what she, all the interesting things that she's done with it. What I'll do now Hopefully, in the next 15 minutes, I can see you guys <laughs> already. I've only just started. Um, is give you a quick overview of the of the data set and uh, talk a bit about um, future data collection and then the data access process in the way that everybody else has done so far. I have got some research results in here, and depending on how quickly I'm going, I might skip over them if I'm just describing the survey. So, Understanding Society, uh, the UK Household Longitudinal Study is um, it's, it's a, a panel study, it's a longitudinal study, it's a social science study really with lots and lots of health data in it. Um, we interview all the adults in the household that we, uh, we see. We have information from all the UK countries, so some of the surveys you've heard about today might just be in England or just in Scotland. We've got um, Wales and Northern Ireland in the data set. We have information from everybody in the household. So we've got information from um, kind of all of our ages. Um, we have an ethnic minor minority boost and then and we cover a wide variety of topics. So in lots of ways, um, understanding society is a kind of a key ESRC resource and investment and there's just a lot of different types of information in the data set. Obviously, we're going to talk about health today, but bear, bear all of that in mind. So the topic areas that um, we uh, cover, um, the blue ones here are the ones that I cover um, in the survey. So I'm the Associate Director for the uh, Biomarker Genetics and Health in the survey. But there's lots and lots of information about all sorts of different aspects of life, really, in the survey. It's called Understanding Society. Um, so education, employment. Um, Laia talked about the extra five minutes uh, where we uh, focus in on some of the eth um, 
th things that are special for uh, ethnic minority people. Um, we, it's a family survey because we're interviewing everybody in the household, so we've got lots of information about family and households. Um, we focus on money and finance, political and social attitudes. So there's, we've quickly added a question about the um, about the election into the survey. We did that when Brexit was happening. So we have we sort of have the facility to do that. Um, we've got a special part of the survey which um, focuses on young people between the ages of 10 and 14, where we interview them and ask specific questions about them. And then we uh, um, have, have information about transport environment. So we're f addressing all of these areas um, in the survey and we have sort of rolling um, content, some of which is core we're asking at every wave some of which which is asked um, at alternate waves every three years or every four years so in terms of the health and well-being data um, we um, ask it via interview so you know we'll ask participants about their mental health every year we um, measure the ghq in the from the participants and the sf 12, um, mental and physical health functioning. So every year we, we kind of know what's happening to people. Um, we ask about uh, health conditions, uh, lot limiting long-standing illness. So there's, there's information that's collected kind of annually from the participants. Um, in the... Uh, in the early waves of the survey, we um, sent a participant to the uh, sent a nurse to the participants' home in the way that was described for Elsa, um, in that that the participants were interviewed by an interviewer, and then they were asked if a nurse could come and visit them. And in that, we had um, we, we did some anthropometric measurements, lung function, blood analytes, and we also collected genetic information. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so just that, that in a little bit more detail. So we've got a, a, um, information from the adults, this sort of GHQ, life satisfaction, um, uh, in different domains from the participants. We ask um, other types of um, mental health types of measures, so the Edin Edinburgh um, Warwick positive well-being question is asked um, intermittently from the participants. And the children have this sort of much more focused uh, uh, questionnaire where we're asking them about kind of things like happiness or well-being in different aspects of their life. And um, every other year we administer the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, which is a sort of clinical um, questionnaire ask, uh, on mental well-being. So what we ask... We, as I said, we've got information about all of the um, all of the participants in the home. Um, what we noticed a few years ago, when looking at how research community uses us, is that there were some parts of the survey were not really being used at all, um, because we actually ask parents about children when they're three and they're five and they're eight, and we noticed that these data are not being used at all. And we, we thought, well, is this because it's not, it, these data are not interesting or is it that people don't know about them? So we did a piece of work where we actually pulled out like the child-specific data so people could see that. And we've been working on sort of um, getting people or the community to engage with understanding society uh, and to facilitate its use. So we've made a file for, for you guys um, which we've called Peach, which brings together the, the data that were already there, but in a single location so that you can sort of, um, it's easier to use. So you're not going off into little, different, lots of different files to try and understand what's happening, you know, because we were asking parents about the children and the roof. So there were lots of different things. Um, so we've, um, it's been constructed by leveraging the data from all the children. And we've got this child-based file um, and it, the information is provided at a child level. And um, so you kind of, we're hoping that this um, data set is going to be useful for you. And there's some evidence now. Last year, we just made it available when I talked about this. And there is some evidence now that people are actually seeing the data and are using it. So that's great. Um, 
as I said, it's sort of structured to facilitate easy tracking of various aspects of the child's development. Um, things like, you know, whether they were born prematurely or past their due date, um, what, what, how they were speaking when they were age three, um, and then this we've provided a crosswave indicator. So um, I encourage people to come and use these data if this is the sort of um, area of research that you do. Um, so you can uh, sort of see uh, predictors and various other things of development. So in terms of adult data, we've got the SF12, GHQ, so health functioning, um, psychological distress, and then we ask about um, health behaviours, so smoking status, um, alcohol uh, consumption, physical activity, and then we ask uh, about sleep behaviours every, every three waves or so. So you can create things like trajectories of sleep and various other things um, if you wanted to, and I encourage you to do that because we don't have very many people using the sleep data. I look after the biomarker data in, the, in understanding society, so I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about that um, uh, because it's the thing that I like. And so, <laughs> so we have information um, in the data set on the genome. So when the nurse went into the participant's home, the nurse uh, collected a blood sample. We extracted DNA from that sample. So we've got genome GWAS data. We also measured um, uh, epigenetic markers. So we have something called methylation data. We also have measured lots and lots of proteins from the data set. So we've got proteome data. And you can see the sort of within, we've kind of gone from the cell to society in that sense in the, in the data set. So the data that I'm mostly going to be talking about now is the biomarker wave, which was um, in wave two is um, the uh, understanding society data. Understanding society actually was an extension of an earlier data set called British Household Panel Study. And we kind of absorbed and expanded um, into understanding society and we collected um, biomarker data from the expanded bit at wave two and then the BHPS participants in wave three. So it's a single wave in that sense in that we don't have the same people at wave two and um, at wave three, but together we've got, um, across, we've got biomarker data across the survey. So we are currently, um, we've gone to wave 13 here in this little picture because we have deposited um, uh, data from 13 waves. This year, in, at the end of the year, we'll be depositing wave 14. We're in the field with wave 15, and we're doing another biomarker wave um, in wave 16. So we just went into the field with a new biomarker wave um, uh, in January, and we will be... Um, in the field for two years and we'll make that data available in 2026. Um, so for those of you who want to uh, con con do more biomarker work with our data set, that'll be available in a couple of years. And I've just realised that I'm, I'm, I'm halfway through my talk and I've just been told I've got five minutes left. So I'll very quickly go through what's available. So we've got genetic data from just under 10,000 of our participants. And one of the um, sadnesses in Understanding Society is that these, the genetic data and, in fact, the, um, the nurse visits were on the main survey. We didn't have ethnic, we didn't go to the ethnic minority booths in the data set. And in fact, the genetic data are only, to, uh, are only collected from um, our white participants. Um, but what we did was from just under 10,000 participants, we extracted DNA and then we ran this sort of chip that measures um, these variations across the genome from, uh, 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 from the entire genome in our participants. And the epigenetic data is a subset of the genetic data. So again, only in our white participants. And we did that in two lots because of funding, um, because of funding availability. And so we have um, methylation um, available from just over 3,000 of our participants. And again, we've measured 
um, these methylation sites across the across the genome. And similar to um, the earlier talk, we are we do have we have made these. Um, biomarkers of age, so these things that tell you how old you are biologically um, uh, from these methylation markers and we've um, made those available. So we've deposited five of these biomarkers of age. Basically they're sort of markers of how old you are, kind of almost like physically under the skin compared to your, to, to your own age. So, um, some, so we have sets of you know, people who are older biologically than their chronological age and younger biologically than their chronological age. And this is a description of the biomarkers. So these first generation biomarkers were ones that were trying to tell, trying to get as close to age as possible. And then a new set of biomarkers were created which sort of look at how fast you're aging and sort of give you um, indications of your, um, yeah, your biology and um, how, how you're doing in terms of your um, under the skin health as it were. So there's lots of these available um, in the data set and um, you can access them. Um, we, uh, as previously said for ELSO, the, the way that we make our data available is through end user license or uh, special license or secure access and these data, these clocks are in, the, are in with our end user license data, where, um, whereas our genetic data you have to apply, for, apply to us. And this is just an example of sort of analysis that we've done with the data where we can see that those people who experienced <coughs> adversity in childhood are kind of on average biologically older than their actual age um, and there's a sort of um, w and current social position isn't associated with that. So we also have um, proteomic data available um, in the data set. So here we just measured a whole bunch of um, biomolecules um, uh, uh, that are, uh, that are related to interesting um, bio biological processes that might be associated with um, how we think the environment gets under the skin. And um, we hope that will be interesting to people if they're thinking about all of this di those different steps I showed you earlier on when you're um, wanting to examine the pathways by which the um, the social environment is associated with health. Um, so these are not established measures of health, they're kind of biologically interesting measures of health that th we think should help you understand kind of pathways and processes. And this is again just an example of how, um, how socially patterned some of these um, proteins are. So um, we can see that, that they are and the, the way that we collected the sample, they're not impacted by the way that we collected the sample. So this is just social differences in proteins and associated with educational attainment. And I'm going really quickly and I'm being told off. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so in terms of understanding society and data deposit and access, um, as I said, uh, as was explained for ELSA, we have the, these three mechanisms that you can get um, access to the data through the archive. So all, uh, all of the data I think I've just shown you is available as end user license, which means you can just register with the archive and um, the data available. Um, some of our data isn't available through the archive. We have to, um, we have to sort of use the managed access process um, because of things like GDPR. So the genetic data are, um, genetic data not linked to any, any non-genetic data. So just genetic data by itself are deposited in something called the European Genome Phenome Archive. Um, and they manage that. So that's just by itself genetic data unlinked to anything else that often geneticists use our data as controls for some of their disease things that they're interested in. Um, if you want data, genetic data that's linked um, with um, non-genetic data, so the questionnaire data and that sort of thing, you have to apply to us and we've got a data set, um, an email address there. So genetics at understandingsociety.ac.uk you can write to and um, you have to apply. There's a form to fill out and we um, 
It's not hosted by the ESRC. It used to be. It's us now that do it because we have to bring it in-house. Um, and this is the um, UK Data Archive. I don't really need to tell you that because it's, <laughs> because it's available. But Understanding Society has lots of... Um, uh, information available on our website. Somebody asked earlier on about training and various other things. So we hold lots of training events for our data set. So um, we have sort of just basic sort of this is the data set, this is how you work with it, and then more involved um, sort of basic training and then more advanced training with, uh, with our data set. So uh, on the website, you'll be able to go to the um, events page and various other pages on the website to, to see how you you can sort of learn about the data set and kind of go through different ways of working with the data set. Um, as I said, the genetics data are available on, with that address there, or you can email me and um, ask me about um, anything you need to know about understanding society. So, thank you. Oh. <laughs>